<clears throat> well, good morning, everybody. Happy uh, August to you. Hope you're enjoying the cool weather. Let's uh, take our Bibles this morning and open them to the book of Genesis chapter 10. Looking this morning at verses 21 through 31, Lord willing. The title of our message this morning is The Problem with the Nations. The Problem with the Nations. We're continuing on in our verse-by-verse study through the book of Genesis, still in Genesis 1 through 11, but making progress. Amen? Amen. We've seen creation, chapters 1 and 2, what the world was like before sin entered the picture, God's original uh, design. And then from there, we've seen the fall, what went wrong. Chapters 3 through 5, a description of the fall. Yet in the midst of the fall, there's hope. There's hope of a coming Savior. That Savior is announced for the first time in Genesis 3, verse 15. Keep that verse in mind because we're going to allude back to it today. But then God intervened in judgment in his creation in the days of the flood. That's event number three, Genesis 6 through 9. And then in the post-flood world, there's the fourth and final event, national dispersion. Um, Let's see. I'm enjoying my slideshow, but you guys can't see it for some reason. I'm sure they're working on that, getting that fixed. But... Genesis 10 is a description of the nations. Genesis Genesis 11 is a description of the Tower of Babel. We'll be getting to that, Lord willing, next week. But then when you get beyond the Tower of Babel, there is a genealogy, and this is a very important genealogy. It goes from Shem to Terah. Abraham's father. And so that's why in the table of nations, Shem, although he is the firstborn, is mentioned last. He's mentioned last because he forms a very nice uh, link, if you, could, if you will, into Genesis chapter 11, where that genealogy is given. Shem is a very, very big deal because it's through Shem that the Messiah that we read about in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 is going to be born. And uh, continuing on here, looks like we're getting a little help there, praise the Lord. Can you guys see that all right? So what we have going on here in Genesis 11 is the sinful origin of the nations. Right now, we just have nations. But what is wrong with these nations? I mean, why can't God use any of these nations to mediate his redemptive purposes to the earth? Why does he have to start a special nation called the nation of Israel? Well, when you understand the link between Genesis 11, the cause, and the nations that came forth, the result, you start to see an explanation for this because the nations themselves are contaminated. Because the nations themselves owe their existence and beginning to what happened at Babel. So whatever happened at Babel was exported into all these nations. And this is why God in Genesis 12 has to start a new nation. So how do you reach this conclusion? You reach this conclusion by understanding that Genesis 11, which caused Genesis 10, happened before Genesis 12. And that's heavy stuff right there, isn't it? Genesis 11 comes before Genesis 12. Do you guys all agree with me on that? You can't understand the calling of Abraham, who who then was named Abram, 
And the linkage between Shem's line and Terah, Abraham's father, unless you understand the contamination of the nations that took place at the Tower of Babel. So that's sort of the, the big picture. So we believe that Genesis 11 is the cause of the problem. Genesis 10 is the results. See, right now we're just given, given this list of nations. We don't know what's wrong with these nations. But we're going to see an explanation of that, Lord willing, beginning next week. Genesis 10, thus far, is just an, an example or a teaching on the nation's emanating from Noah's three sons. The birth order is Shem, then Ham, and Joppeth, but Shem is going to be mentioned last in this table, even though Shem is the firstborn, because he's the one the Holy Spirit wants, to, wants us to keep our eyes on. We have to keep our eyes on him because the, Messi the Messiah, the Messianic promise, is not coming through Ham's line. It's not coming through Japheth's line, but it's coming through Shem's line. So Shem is mentioned last, and that in our mind is supposed to link us to the genealogy at the end of Genesis 11, linking Shem to Terah, Abraham's father. So in Genesis 10, here is sort of an outline that we have been following. We've seen an introduction to the table of nations, verse 1. And then we saw Japheth's line, verses 2 through 5. You see there on the map where Japheth's descendants settled. Europe, and from Europe, ultimately North America. And we went through Japheth's various sons, that are mentioned there in verse 2 of Genesis 10. And then we had a switch and we began to examine the lineage of the second of Noah's sons, a man named Ham, verses 6 through 20. There are Ham's four sons. We looked at those and their children and their grandchildren. One of them was named Nimrod, and he caused a lot of trouble. He was actually a prefigurement of the coming Antichrist. Some of Ham's descendants settled up there in the land of Canaan, and we talked about that. But essentially, that's where Ham's descendants went. Essentially, Africa and one of those sons settled in the land of Canaan, and we talked through the intricacies of that. And now we're switching subjects and we're moving to Shem's line, which is described in verses 21 through 31, which we're going to look at, Lord willing, this morning. If you look there on the map, you see where Shem's descendants went, essentially into that Middle Eastern territory, that grayish area there, according to the map, that sometimes we call the Middle East. Here's another map basically showing you where Shem's descendants settled in comparison to Ham's descendants and Joppeth's descendants. Now, from Shem, the name Shem, we get the word Semite. So from Shem came the Semitic people groups of the earth. Who would those be? The Assyrians. The Babylonians, the Persians, the Arabs, and ultimately the Hebrews, because it's through Shem's line that the nation of Israel is going to be born. In fact, when you look very carefully at verse 21, which is the beginning of Shem's line, you see the origin of the word well, the, the word is Eber, but that's the origin of the word Hebrews. Where did that name Hebrews came, come from? It came from Eber, which is mentioned there in verse 21. So notice what Genesis 10, and notice what verse 21 says. Also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber. Arnold Fruchtenbaum says this in his very good commentary on the book of Genesis. He says, the line of Shem begins in verse 21 
And unto Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, Eber in Hebrew is Ever, and is the source of the Hebrew word for Hebrew. To be the father of the Hebrews is the main significance of Shem. So from Shem is going to come the Hebrews. Now that would make sense. Because God said that the Messianic line is going to continue through the line of Shem. And so we know that it has to be one of those nations through Shem's line that the Messiah is going to come from. Who's God going to use? The Assyrians? The Babylonians? The Persians? No, he can't. And he won't. Because all of those other nations owe their tainted origin to the Tower of Babel. So God has to, to get his purposes across and bring his Messiah to the earth, he has to start a new nation independent of what happened at the Tower of Babel. And that becomes the significance of the nation of Israel. This is why the nation of Israel in the Bible started through the patriarch Abram is such a big deal. It is the only nation in the history of the world that owes its origins not to the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11, because it was started after the Tower of Babel, Genesis 12. And God formed that very special nation to reach the other nations through the birth of his Messiah. And that's why you start to see the origin of Hebrew there in verse 21 through Shem's line. You see, if you've been following with us through the book of Genesis, you start to see a tension building here. We know there's a Messiah coming. We know that as early as the fall of man. Because the Messiah's coming is mentioned in Genesis 3, verse 15, where God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, speaking to Satan, between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise you on the head, but you shall bruise him on the heel. Aha, there's coming one into the world who will take Satan's head and crush it. The issue is, well, through which nation? Is the Messiah going to come? Maybe he's going to come through the Egyptians. Maybe he's going to come through the Persians. Maybe he's going to come through the Assyrians. Maybe later in biblical history he's going to come through the Romans. And the answer to those questions is no, 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 no. Why? Because all of those other nations have been contaminated by their origin, which goes back to the Tower of Babel. God consequently has and must start a new nation. The nation of Israel is the only nation that was started independently of the effects of the Tower of Babel. And this is why God is so upset with Israel when her desire is to be just like everyone else. You remember Israel wanted a king, 1 Samuel chapter 8. Well, why do you want a king? Everybody else has a king. God says, well, who cares what everybody else thinks? Who cares what the neighbors are doing? Who cares what the Joneses are doing? I have created you as a nation to be separate and distinct from the other nations. And this is why God, later on in biblical history, when Israel became idolatrous, just like all the other nations around her, had to send her into a time of 70-year discipline to rid her of that sin of idolatry. You see, Israel only had the ability in God to reach everyone else when she was different than everyone else. When she became just like everyone else, she, lose, she lost her distinctiveness. Now, I understand that we as the church are not the nation of Israel, but we are a work of God, and the same principle holds true with us. We only have the ability to reach a lost and dying world when we look differently than the lost and dying world we're trying to reach. The moment the church adopts the same values as the world, 
and starts to look exactly like the world is the moment the church loses its influence to reach the world it's supposed to be reaching. This is why the book of James chapter 4 and verse 4 calls the New Testament church adulterous because she had become just like the surrounding world. So your ability and effectiveness as a Christian is not from saying weird things and dressing funny and doing obnoxious things. Your effectiveness as a Christian comes from the fact that your family members, your co-workers, see in your lifestyle a different value system. You're obviously marching to the beat of a different drummer. Somebody tells a dirty joke, they're in the office around the water cooler, and you don't laugh. Gosh, there's something different about her, or something different about him. I wonder what it is. And that's the platform or the pulpit that the Lord is now giving you to reach all of these lost people in the office. If your value system is exactly like theirs, there's really no incentive for them to listen to anything you have to say. Worldliness causes the church to lose its effectiveness. It's the same principle with the nation of Israel. She had this mission, this messianic mission, to mediate God's blessings to the entire world coming from the line of Shem, And yet when she became just like everybody else, she lost her ability to mediate these blessings. So if you've been tracking with us through the book of Genesis, we know that a Messiah is coming. We know that that Messiah came through the line of Seth, you might recall, Genesis 4 verse 25, through Noah Genesis 5, verse 29, but Noah has three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, through which of those three sons is the Messiah going to come from? And the answer is right there in Genesis 9, verse 26. The messianic lineage is narrowed at that point because it says, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. Aha, the Messiah is going to come from the line of Shem. He's going to come from those Semitic people groups of the earth. Now, as you continue on through the book of Genesis, we'll eventually come to (coughs) Genesis 12, verse 3, where we learn the Messiah is going to come from Abraham, then Isaac, and then Jacob. Aha, he's going to be Jewish. He's going to be Hebrew. And by the time you get outside of the book of Genesis, Genesis 49 and verse 10, within Israel... There's going to be 12 tribes. You know exactly what tribe he's going to come from. From the tribe of Judah. And then when you factor in prophecies in the book of Micah, chapter 5 and verse 2, you're actually going to know what city within the tribe of Judah he's going to be born in. And all of this history is narrated for the benefit of the Hebrew race who had been in slavery for 400 years and had their history wiped out. They had their history revised by the Egyptians. And now that they're out of Egypt, this book, as pinned through Moses, is going to be given to that group in its totality, reminding them of who they are in God. Don't be just like everyone else because you have a different calling on your life. Your job is not to be just like the Egyptians or the Persians or the Assyrians. And the same principle holds true for the church. Your job as a church, your job as a Christian is not to be just like everyone else. In fact, God wants to make you different than anyone else so that you can have a platform or a pulpit to reach everyone else. And if I just become like everybody else in terms of my value system then I lose my effectiveness and authority as a disciple of Jesus Christ. You cannot reach the world by becoming like the world. It's your separateness from the world that gives you the authority to speak to the world. And this is why Satan is always trying to push the Christian or the believer into worldliness, 
worldly values because he knows it will neuter, it will destroy the effectiveness of your evangelistic efforts as a disciple of Jesus Christ. It does disturb me greatly to see church after church after church adopting the philosophy of the world. How should we govern the church? The church growth consultants and gurus say, well, let's figure out how they govern in management the secular world. Let's read a bunch of books by Stephen Covey and Abraham Maslow, and let's bring the world's philosophies into the church so the church can be managed right. Well, how do you get the church to grow? Well, let's see how they make the organizations grow in the world. They come up with a business plan. They come up with a marketing mix. They come up with something that everyone wants to hear. Well, how should we counsel people in the church? Well, how do they counsel people in the secular world? They buy into Freud, Skinner, Jung, and let's counsel people based on humanistic psychological principles because that's what works in the world. And eventually you become so worldly that there's almost no distinction between your value system and the world. And your average unbeliever out there says, well, why should I give any credence to Christianity. It's just like what I hear in a secular classroom or at a management consultant business seminar. And so there's something to be said for being separate from the world. That was the nation of Israel. She had a special calling to bring Jesus, the Messiah, through the line of Shem into the world. Look, if you could, again, at Genesis chapter 10 and look at the rest of verse 21. Also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, that's the origin of the word Hebrew, as we've explained, and the older brother of Japheth. So if Shem is the oldest, why is he being mentioned last? Because he's the link in the chain genealogically that hooks us into the next chapter. That's why he's mentioned last, even though he's the firstborn. And then it says there in verse 21, children were born to him. To him were born Shem's line. And we know that the Messiah is gonna come through Shem's line and thus the nation of Israel is going to come through Shem's line. As you look at verse 22, you actually see who Shem's immediate sons were. Look at verse 22. The sons of Shem were Elam and Asher and Afarshad, if I'm pronouncing that right. Depends on which uh, syllable gets the emphasis. Lud and Aram, five sons of Shem. Now here is something very interesting and the one to keep your eye on as you go through the Bible. It's Elam. Who is Elam? From Elam come the Persians. How do we know that? Because Daniel had a vision. And he had that vision in what he saw was the province of Elam. Same name here. And he says within Elam there was a capital city named Susa. Susa was the capital city of Persia. So from the Persians, from Elam, I should say, came forth the Persians. Daniel 8 and verse 2 says, I looked in the vision, and while I was looking, I was in the citadel of Susa, which is in the province of Elam. That's our guy, the descendant of Shem. And I looked in the vision, and I myself was beside the Uli Canal. So from Elam comes Susa, the capital of Persia. Persia is a big deal in the Bible. Persia was the empire that followed Babylon. The second empire that came to power during the future 70 years of Babylonian captivity. Persia would be the chest and arms of silver according to the dream and the statue that we learn about in Daniel chapter Two. Daniel 7 tells us that Persia is the bear. 
the second empire that God would raise up during this difficult time of the Babylonian captivity. And Persia is huge. Because God put a calling on the Persian Empire to be the good guy. And to help Israel get out of the captivity. In fact, there is an archaeological record of what is called the Cyrus Cylinder. That's Cyrus's boasts as he, the leader of Persia, around 539 BC overthrew the Babylonians. You say, well, why is Cyrus the Persian such a big deal? Because God called out his name 200 years before it happened. In fact, liberals are so upset about this, they think that these prophecies in the book of Isaiah couldn't have been written by Isaiah. Because how could Isaiah, 200 years in advance, know that this Persian leader was going to be a man named Cyrus? But in your Bible, what you'll discover is Cyrus's name is called out 200 years before it happened. I mean, just to show you the mind-boggling nature of this, it would be like God calling out Ronald Reagan 200 years before he showed up and say he's going to be the President of the United States. And boom, it happens 200 years later. That's the equivalent of what's happening here with this man Cyrus the Persian. If you look at Isaiah 44 verse 28, or you can just jot this down, you'll see Cyrus's name mentioned. It says, it is I who says of Cyrus, 200 years before the man ever existed, he is my shepherd and he will perform all my desire. He declares of Jerusalem, she will be rebuilt. And the temple, your foundation will be laid. Isaiah 45 verse 1, next chapter, continues on with the same prophecies. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue the nations before him and to loose the loins of kings to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. Persians, you're the good guys. You're going to lead Israel out of the 70-year captivity after you conquer Babylon, after the head of gold moves into the chest and arms of silver. And not only am I revealing all of this ahead of time, I'm going to tell you exactly who it is that's going to lead the parade, so to speak. And thus we have the Cyrus Cylinder, a fulfillment of that prophecy where Cyrus boasted of how easy it was for him to conquer Babylon. Yeah, Cyrus, the reason it was easy is because God put you in that position 200 years before you ever existed. As a Christian, you don't have to spend time with sweaty palms, nervous, about the direction of the world. God knows exactly what's going on. And the truth of the matter is God has put, put certain people into places of authority for certain seasons. And these are people you may not have even voted for. Dare I even say it? Maybe I shouldn't even say it here in Texas. God can use a Democrat. Oh, did I say that? I mean, he could use someone that is totally hostile to your value system as a Christian. How, how, do I, how, do, how do you know that? Because Cyrus didn't know God. How do I know Cyrus didn't know God? Because the Bible says so. Isaiah 45 and verse 4 says of Cyrus, though you did not know me. And yet, what does the Bible teach? It teaches that the king's hand is, uh, or the king's heart, I should say, is like water in a water course. Proverbs 21 verse 1. Just as a water course directs water, God directs the heart of a king and can steer it any direction he wants. Rather than being upset and being fearful over the condition of the United States government, maybe we ought to go to prayer. Say to ourselves, well, God, you, you allowed all of these things. And you're in control. And I pray that the perfect will would be executed 
your perfect will would be executed, whatever it is, in the current administration. I mean, doesn't the Bible tell us frequently to intercede for those in positions of power? Doesn't 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 4, tell us to make entreaties and petitions for those that are in authority? Why should I do it? Because God's in control. God was totally and completely in control of the Persian Empire. In fact, in biblical history, the three returns from the 70-year captivity... Return 1, Ezra 1 through 6. Return 2, Ezra 7 through 10. Return 3, the book of Nehemiah. And if you're really wanting to fill out your biblical timeline, right at the end of Ezra 6, but before Ezra 7 starts, is the whole story of the book of Esther. This is a fascinating time in Israeli history where the Jews went back into the land and they began to rebuild their temple and it was under the Persian empire Cyrus being the first king in this parade if I can use that expression that God used why did the Jews come back into the land under the Persians why was it so easy for the Persians to overthrow the Babylonians because God is in control of history But I'll tell you something else that's very interesting. Persia, coming from Elam, continued on as an empire right on down to modern times. And in 1935, something very interesting happened. Persia's name was changed to Iran. Persia or Iran, still an ally of then, which would later be the newborn state of Israel. Persia would continue on as an ally of the United States and the reborn state of Israel in 1948. But my goodness, Ezekiel saw something in the sixth century. He saw Persia that's mentioned in the Bible. You'll find it in Ezekiel 38 and verse 5, turning against the nation of Israel. Probably was a prophecy that made no sense to Ezekiel. Because Persia was one of the good guys. And yet Ezekiel says, no, what I saw in the vision, Ezekiel 38 and verse 5, in this end time invasion, that Persia, and we've looked at all of these other names, believe it or not, in our study in Genesis 10, because these names are all found in Genesis 10. The only one we haven't looked at is Elam, leading to Persia. Persia would turn against Israel. You know, Pastor Chuck Smith, a pastor I appreciate it very much, would do tours over to Israel. 1978, 1977, 1976, and he would tell the Israeli tour guides while he was there, you better keep your eye on Iran, because it's going to turn. It's going to turn against you. Of course, ridiculous. Ridiculous. Who would think such a thing could happen? Ezekiel's prophecy of Persia, a good guy, Persia who led Israel out of the captivity, turning against Israel, would seem crazy. And yet that's what Ezekiel saw. The interesting thing about Bible prophecy is if you give time, enough time to elapse, history catches up to what God said. And in 1979, in our own lifetime, there was a revolution in Iran. You might remember the long gas lines, the days of Jimmy Carter, the days of the Shah, where the Shah was deposed and replaced by the Ayatollah. And in 1979, Persia turned. She became a Shiite, Islamic theocracy that now has a theology in place to blot out the nation of Israel. 
1979 would be the key year when everything shifted. Now, Ezekiel's prophecies don't look so crazy, do they? And Pastor Chuck started getting phone calls from Israelis post-1979 asking him, well, what's going to happen next? (laughs) Because now he had credibility to speak. This is how your Bible reveals things before they happen. And we are privileged because we're basically living in the time period when many of the biblical predictions are reaching their fulfillment. Do elections matter? Does change in government matter? It sure does. At the top of the screen, you see what Iran was like prior to the deposing of the Shah. It was a Fairly what we would call a progressive country, women could wear dresses and shorts and drive cars and get education. And look at what it is today. Look at the burqas, look at the masks, look at the mind-numbing slavishness to an Islamic theocracy that is mandated or you're killed. Things change very quickly. Things change very, very fast. 1979 is when this change happened. You don't have to look far to see it other than to see what they teach Iranian children in the textbooks. Abraham Lincoln put it this way. He said, the philosophy of the schoolroom in one generation will be the philosophy of government in the next. Yoram Edinger, a Jewish individual trying to convince Congress of the hostility of Iran, simply said, look at what they're teaching the kids. Quote, Iranian school textbooks such as the Quran and Life, grade 12, prepare Iranian children for the Ayatollah's sublime goal, the apocalyptic, horrifying, millenarian military battle against the USA and other arrogant, oppressive powers, which are ostensibly led by idolatrous devils. Boy, the days of... uh, Janet and Mark, which is the, what I read to learn how to read and spell, boy, those days are long gone in Iran. Kids are being radicalized at the earliest age possible. While the Savior, the infallible, immortal, div- divinely ordained and eventual global leader, the Mahdi, has not yet surfaced, yet Iranian children are taught that the battle is already raging throughout the world, awaiting their sacrifice. School textbooks of Western democracies, Yorm Edinger says, are the most authentic reflection of people's values and worldview. You show me any nation in the history of the world and I'll show you what their values are based on what they teach their children. We wonder why the United States of America is is running off the rails. Why is the country becoming humanistic? Just a matter of looking at the textbooks and seeing what values are transmitted. Yorm Edinger says school textbooks of tyrannies are the most authentic reflection of the nature and mission of the regimes. Iranian school textbooks reflect the strategy and tactics of the Ayatollahs much more authentically than speeches and interviews and diplomatic statements and conversations conducted by the president and the foreign minister. Forget what the politician says, say, Yorm Edinger says. That's not how you figure out where a country is headed. You look at what they're teaching the kids. You know, here at Sugarland Bible Church, I'm very proud of the fact that we have a vibrant children's ministry. In fact, my wife, literally all day, it's not an exaggeration, yesterday is preparing for her class that she's teaching right now. Covering things that these kids will never hear in a public school classroom. I said, what are you studying over there? She says, well, I'm studying why there's no, the missing link in the chain of mammals called bats. 
Is that what you were studying yesterday? Gee, I'm looking at all of that vertebrae and it's, a lot of it's over my head. I'm trying to communicate to these kids that there's no missing link. She spends all day going over that, as do our other teachers here, because they know that this is information that these kids are never going to get in any kind of setting, most likely, especially the public schools. This is what Yoram Edinger is saying. This is an outworking of what Ezekiel said would happen. Persia is going to change. And you're seeing it today right down to what they teach in the classroom. In fact, you're seeing Persia allied with Turkey and Russia Exactly what Ezekiel said to invade the land of Israel. Ron Rhodes says the unique alignment of nations described in Ezekiel 38 and 39 has never occurred in the past but is occurring now. It's not just watching these nations change. It's the interesting thing. It's watching how they all get along with each other and are in cahoots with each other. Because the enemy of my enemy is my what? My friend. And uh, my goodness, if the signs of Christmas are present, not quite yet in August, but give it a few months, and you'll hear about Santa Claus and Christmas tree lights and department stores and Christmas gifts and Christmas songs on the radio. And then you're going to say to yourself, Thanksgiving is coming. (laughs) Because Thanksgiving occurs earlier on the calendar than Christmas, right? That's the season that we're living in. The signs of the tribulation period, which are rapidly coming, is signs that the rapture of the church is coming even faster. And you better know Jesus personally, given the time period that we're entering. And you better be in a position to communicate these things to the lost and dying. Because God has ordained your very birth and your existence for this season. We say to God, boy, the world is just getting too tough, Lord. I mean, why couldn't I have been born in another era? My mom used to tell me that. She said, you were born old. The, w- the way you complain about everything, you talk like you're, you know, she told me this when I was a teenager, you talk like you're a 70 or 80 year old man. I mean, I've always wanted to be born, to be frank with you, in a different generation. But the truth of the matter is God needs you in this generation. He needs you right now. It's like uh, the book of Esther, chapter 4, verse 14. For such a time as this, hey, help, help may come from someone else, but you were raised up for this very hour. And this is how we need to look at this time period in which we find ourselves. Another son of Shem is Asher, Asher was the ancestor of the Assyrians, Jonathan Sarfati tells us. Indeed, when the English word Assyria is used, it is the Hebrew word Asher. These Semitic Assyrians replace the Hamitic Assyrians of Genesis 10 verse 11. Assyria later became a powerful empire noted for its cruelty. Why were the Assyrians so cruel? Did you know that it was the Assyrians that invented the crucifixion? Rome just popularized it, but it was invented by the Assyrians And you understand this and you understand why God, when he commissioned Jonah to preach to Nineveh, the key city of Assyria, went the exact opposite direction. And why Jonah is sort of angry at God at the end of his book. I I knew, God, you were going to do this. I know that you're a God of grace and love and mercy. And I just knew that you were going to pour out your grace on undeserving people. I mean, how could you reach those people? 
Not understanding that all of us, Jonah included, would have nothing from God if he hadn't first extended his grace to us. It's kind of interesting that being in grace so long, we forget that we were saved by grace and that the people out there that we detest need the exact same grace. And it was Nimrod, you remember from our prior studies, that following the confounding of the language was pushed up into Assyria, building his empire, not just in Babel, but in Assyria as well. And this is the biblical background for why the Assyrians were so wicked. Why did God use the Assyrians to disperse the ten kingdoms in the north? in 722 BC because they were wicked to the bone and yet God loved them and wanted a relationship with them. You come to verse uh, 23 and you come to this man Aram. Aram is sort of interesting because Aram is going to have four sons. Don't panic, I'm not gonna talk through every single son. But notice, if you will, verse 23, I'm just bringing the ones to your attention that are highly significant in terms of interpreting the rest of the Bible. It says, the sons of Aram were Uz and Hul and Gether and Mash. You recognize this one here at the top? Uz or Uz? Isn't there a book of the Bible that takes place in the land of Uz? The book of Job, that's generally where people think, can't be dogmatic on it, where this land was. Job chapter 1 verse 1 says there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job and the man was blameless and upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. Did you know that the book of Job is the oldest book of the Bible in terms of the date when it was written. It doesn't record the oldest events. The book of Genesis does that. But the book of Job will predate the book of Genesis by at least six centuries. Five to six centuries before Moses penned the book of Genesis, the book of Job was already on the books. The very first book that God inspired What does the book of Job deal with? It deals with something that bugs every single one of us. Suffering. God, if you're a God of righteousness and and God, if you're a God of love, what what sense can we make of this suffering that I am experiencing and that those around me are experiencing? That is a question that plagues people from cradle to grave. I mean, that, that one really bothers us. So-and-so loves Jesus, and look at how badly they're being treated. Look at how badly they're being persecuted. Lord, I'm trying to live for you, and I've got everybody coming against me. What's, What's the deal, Lord? And the Lord says, well, that's why the book of Job is the first book I wrote. I knew you would struggle with this. I knew this theodicy of human suffering would be on your minds perpetually. So six centuries before the book of Genesis was penned, there it is in the book of Job. You want to know about suffering and the sovereignty of God and and why the righteous suffer in this life? Read the book of Job. The book of Job takes place in Uz, one of the four sons of Aram. And then there's this son here of Shem, uh, Shem a man named Farshad, if I'm pronouncing that right. And look, if you will, at verse 24 of Genesis 10. And I'm looking at this word and I've completely mispronounced it. So I'm going to try something different. A a park shot. How's that? You guys are quiet out there. Became the father of Shelah, and Shelah became the father of Eber. So we have our park shot, then Shelah, and then Eber. And from Eber is going to come the, starts with an H, 
Hebrews. And then you go to verse 25 and you learn that Eber, who's a generation removed from our Pakshad, has two sons. Well, who are they? I'm glad you asked. Look at Genesis 10 and look, if you will, at verse 25. Two sons were born to Eber. The name of one was Peleg. Not Pele, as in the soccer player, but Peleg. For in his day, the earth was divided. And his brother's name was Jokpan. First son is Peleg. Peleg's very name in scripture means division. Because something took place in his generation where the earth itself was divided. Now, there is a lot of very interesting discussion about continental drift. The fact that you kind of put the continents together, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. It kind of looks like they all fit in one landmass at one point. And then there was a division and we have the different continents today. And a lot of people spill a lot of ink trying to link continental drift to Genesis 10 and verse 25. And to be honest with you, I think it's a very fascinating conversation. You know, I, I would love to know what divided the continents if in fact they were divided. It just has nothing to do with the passage. Because the three rules of real estate are location, location, location. The three rules of Bible study are context, context, context. An interesting scientific question about, the, about continental drift is foreign to the context here. What is at stake here is the division of the language that's going to happen in the next chapter. If you look at Genesis 10 verse 5, you'll see each according to his language. If you look at Genesis 10 verse 20, each according to their languages. If you look at uh, Genesis 10 verse 31, according to their languages. That's the division that's being spoken of here, not the division of the continents. So in Peleg's day, the earth was divided. I think what it means is the language was divided. And God divided the language into multiple languages, preventing the builders at the Tower of Babel from cooperating with each other because God is against world government. Listen to the politicians today. They hardly can get through a speech without saying government, global government, new world order. In fact, my friends in Australia tell me that in a section of Australia, they sent me the news article that the government official there put them again under a severe lockdown and basically said, get used to it, it's the new world order. Man in his lostness has always thought if he could sort of put together a new world order that would fix the world's problems. And you see in Genesis 11 that God was against it. That should shape your view of globalism. One worldism. You don't want one worldism unless the right ruler is ruling. And that won't happen until Jesus rules planet earth from Jerusalem on David's throne. Until that happens, I'm not interested in being part of a new world order. Arnold Fruchtenbaum says the name of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. The name Peleg means to divide. Some identify this event with continental drift or the continental, or continental divide. However, contextually, it more likely refers to the language division of the Tower of Babel judgment. This, seems, this means that the confusion of tongues occurred in Peleg's lifetime. Uh, Henry Morris, lengthy quote here, says the same thing. Leupold, 
in his commentary on Genesis says the same thing. Even, even my friend John Calvin got this one right. <laughs> See, Calvin was living in the 16th century and he wasn't really concerned with all of these scientific type issues that we think about today. And he says this, for after he, Moses, has mentioned our foxod as the third of the sons of Shem, he then names Peleg his great grandson, in whose day the languages were divided. The second son of Eber was a man named Joktan, and Joktan has 13 sons verses 26 through 29, which I am not even going to make an attempt to read. That's your outside reading. You go down to verse 30, and it sort of gives you the territory of the sons of Joktan. And it says in verse 30, now their settlement extended from Misha as you go towards Safar, the hill country of the east. Boy, so much intricate geography mentioned here. You get the feeling that this actually happened. I mean, if Google Maps were available in this time period, you get the feeling you could get out the Google Maps and see exactly where these places are. That's the mind-numbing detail in your Bible. You look at verse 31, and it says, These are the sons of Shem, according to the families... According to the languages, by their lands, according to their nations. So something happened that divided the earth tribally by family. Divided the earth linguistically by language. Divided the earth territorially by, according to lands and created the modern nations. What was that event? You get the answer in Genesis 11. Genesis 11 is the cause. Genesis 10 is the results. You come to the very end of the chapter, the conclusion, and you have a chapter summary. It says, these are the families of the sons of Noah according to their genealogies by their nations. And out of these nations were separated on the earth after the flood. What we have seen here believe it or not, are 70 nations. Nations that are key to Israel's past as she interacts with them and Israel's future. And you would have no knowledge of where these people groups came from without Genesis 10. I mean, in a book about beginnings, beginning of the universe, beginning of life, beginning of man, beginning of marriage, beginning of evil, beginning of clothing. Why did you guys wear clothes today? I mean, it's hot. You could have come in here without clothes on. Why do you do that? Genesis tells you why. And it spares the rest of us of a lot of other things. Where did religion come from? Where did salvation come from? Why are there languages? Where did government come from? Where did Israel come from? You would expect in a book of beginnings to have some explanation of these nations. And you get that in Genesis 10. Do you see how clueless the unsaved world is to all of these subjects? Because they don't start with God's word. They come up with a bunch of silly philosophies to explain where all these things came from. And yet you as a Bible reader understand the answers to life's most perplexing questions because you gave your heart and mind and thoughts to a book that you believe God wrote. You see how far ahead of the game you are in the secular society in which you live. Verse 32 is very clear that this lineage came from Noah after the flood. So from Adam came Noah. From Noah came Noah's three sons eventually, Shem, Ham, and Joppeth. And keep your eyes on Shem. Because it's through Shem that the Messiah and the Messianic lineage is going to be Extended, But the common ancestor is Noah, linking back to the common ancestor, Adam. 
yeah, but man, where are we going to put our pre-Adamic race? Well, you're not going to put the pre-Adamic race anywhere because there's no such thing. You're going to follow what God says. Acts 17 verse 26 says, He made from one man, Adam, every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Through all of this, the earth was repopulated through Noah's three sons after the flood. So in this section of the book of Genesis, National Division, we've just finished the first major major part of it, the table of nations. And yet, why didn't God use the Persians, use the Egyptians, use the Assyrians, use the Babylonians to bring his son into the world? There was something going on at the Tower of Babel called the mother-child cult or religious system. Something that Nimrod and his wife Samarimus and their son Tammuz were practicing that became a religion. And when God confounded the language, all of the builders at Babel took part of that system into their respective people groups, ethnicities, nations, and languages. They just changed the names around a little bit. We're not going to worship the mother and the son, Samarimus and Tamas, uh, over here in Rome. We'll just call them Venus and Cupid. And over here in Egypt, we'll just call it Osiris and Horus. And there are examples all over the world today of the remains of this religious system that goes back to the Tower of Babel. That religious system, the worship of the mother and the son, is a satanic counterfeit of the true gospel. Every single nation was contaminated by it. So God says, you know what? I'm going to start anew. You know, God is really good at starting fresh things. I'm going to start with a brand new nation that is uncontaminated by this idolatry. And I will pick the least likely guy I can find, Abram. And I will tell him to walk by faith and separate himself from what he knew. And I will tell him to walk by faith because he's going to walk into a land that he doesn't know anything about. And I'm going to start from scratch. And that's how my Messiah is going to come to the earth. God is starting over. After the flood, God started over. After the Tower of Babel, God started over. And you know who else God wants to start over with? He wants to start over with you. That's why when a person trusts in Christ for salvation, the Bible says they become a what? Creature. New creature, new creation. For the old things have passed, the new things have come. I mean, there's such an emphasis on newness in Christianity because that's God's character. In fact, what he wants to do is he wants to communicate the gospel of his son, God the Son, Jesus Christ. He wants people to understand that Jesus died on a cross 2,000 years ago. Not because he had a generic perspective in mind for humanity, but he died on the cross because he was thinking about you as a person. Think about that. As Jesus was dying on the cross, he was thinking about you as an individual. He was thinking about me. Christianity is individual. Christianity is personal. God has no grandchildren. I cannot live off the faith of my parents and their parents. I have to have my own faith in Christ. I have to become his new work, his new child. And you become God's child by understanding this through a ministry that the Spirit does in the world called conviction. 
And then as a lost human being comes under that conviction, they exercise their own faith in what Jesus has done. And if you're looking to do good works, quite frankly, that's the only work God is going to accept. He will not accept our good works. What he will accept is the good work his son did for us 2,000 years ago. And you become a Christian that way. It's not some kind of multi-tiered, multi-layered process. The world of religion says that. The, The world of Gnosticism, boy, you look at the Gnostics in the first century and you look at all of the layers and levels people had to go through to attain spirituality and Christianity is so simple. And so our exhortation to, for people that are here in the building listening or are listening online or listening via archive after the fact is God is the same yesterday, today and forever. His convicting ministry until the day of judgment comes continues to go out to the whole world. And our exhortation, because it has eternal consequences, is to follow through with that conviction that people are under and trust in the Savior. That is the gospel. That is the best news that God ever gave man. And it's the only news which can save a lost soul. So wouldn't it be great in a book of new beginnings to receive the ultimate new beginning from God, which is salvation itself. If anyone has questions about it, I'm available after the service to talk. But it is not a matter of walking an aisle, praying a prayer, joining a church, filling out a card, giving money, joining a denomination, trying harder. It's a matter of trusting in what Jesus did for us. He did something for us as we've celebrated this morning at the Lord's table that we could not do for ourselves. We trust in that and we receive what he has done as a free gift. Shall we pray? Father, we're grateful for the book of Genesis, grateful for the Lord's table. I do pray you'll be with us as we fellowship afterwards with the fellowship meal. And help us to walk out these truths this week. We ask things in Jesus' name and God's people said.